Fleets of Allied armies had isolated large parts of the German force in Italy. On Sunday afternoon, April 29th, two German officers, looking rather incongruous in civilian clothing, sat down at the headquarters of the British Army near Naples and signed the first formal surrender of German forces. Their signatures handed over to the British nearly a million men. Three days later, on May 2nd, the ranking German left alive in Berlin emerged from his bunker with a white flag and surrendered the capital and its garrison to the Soviet Red Army. From his headquarters in northern Germany, Admiral Dönitz realized he couldn't play for time any longer. He sent a representative, Admiral von Friedeberg, across the front lines into the British sector to meet with General Bernard Montgomery. Dönitz instructed von Friedeberg to surrender all of the German forces fighting in northern Germany, even those fighting the Russians to the east. But Montgomery rejected that offer. The British Field Marshal would accept only the surrender of enemy forces directly facing his front line. Montgomery told von Friedeberg to return to Dönitz and relay this message. The next evening, May 4th, Von Friedeberg and his delegation returned to Montgomery's headquarters. They agreed to surrender only the German forces in Denmark, Holland, and northern Germany. So we've assembled here today to accept the surrender terms uh, which have been made with a delegation from the German army. I will now read out the terms of that instrument of surrender. The document explained that the German surrender was accepted without conditions. The Germans would have to comply with all orders issued by the Allied commanders. And the German delegation will now sign this, uh, this paper. The General Admiral von Friedeberg uh, will uh, sign first. Next. On May 6th, Admiral Dönitz sent his army commander, General Jodl, and Admiral von Friedeberg to Eisenhower's headquarters in northern France to negotiate the surrender of all the German forces. German delegation arrived, expecting to be treated as professionals to meet Eisenhower, possibly have coffee, certainly handshakes, and then discuss surrender terms. They were met by Eisenhower's chief of staff, who told them politely but firmly, there are no terms. You will surrender unconditionally, period. The German delegation went back, told Dernitz, he realized he had no choice. They went back, surrender documents were placed in front of them, and they were told to sign. At the end of the ceremony, Jodl praised the suffering of the German people and armed forces and expressed hope that the victors will treat them with generosity. After they signed, Eisenhower did meet with them. There were no handshakes. Eisenhower asked them bluntly, do you understand the terms of this surrender? Once they said, yes, we do, he turned around and left. It had been a cruel, a horrible, a terrible war. And Eisenhower, to his credit, in my opinion, was not about to treat them as gentlemen. Eisenhower went out to the map room to meet with his staff, and they said, we've got to write a communique. And everybody had a try at writing out an appropriately eloquent last wartime message. And as they grew more and more eloquent, Eisenhower was growing more and more impatient with them, and finally he threw them all aside and pulled out a piece of paper and scribbled 
by hand to the mission of this Allied force was completed at 0245 hours, May 7, 1945, signed Eisenhower. And the war was over. From New York City's Times Square, to London's Piccadilly Circus, to Moscow's Red Square, the victorious Allies celebrated the end of the war in Europe. But the surrender would not go into effect officially until May 8th. President Harry Truman declared May 8th as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. The lights went on again. World War II was both a war and a crime. Millions of innocent people were killed and millions more lost their homes and property. The victims cried out for justice. Those who brought this suffering must be made to answer for their crimes. After World War I, the Allies had decided in the peace treaty that people accused of war crimes should be tried. And one of the many concessions made to the Germans after the First World War was a change which the Allies had agreed to in the Versailles Treaty that the Germans would try these criminals themselves. Well, that proved an absolute and total fiasco. And uh, the Allies were not about to try that a second time. Near the end of the war, the Allies organized a war crimes commission and set up a system for bringing criminals to justice. The commission decided that individuals who committed atrocities against persons or property would return for trial near the scene of their crime. Individuals accused of specific crimes, like killing prisoners of war or downed airmen, would be brought before military courts. An international tribunal would try the major war criminals, Hitler and the men of his inner circle. But Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, and other high-ranking Nazis committed suicide before they could be arrested. One by one, the Allies found and arrested the military commanders of the Reich, the men who ran the Nazi war machine. Chief of the Luftwaffe, Reich's Marshal Hermann Göring, surprisingly turned himself in to the U.S. Army. His captors received him more like a visiting dignitary than a prisoner of war. When the press learned that Göring had fallen into American hands, of course they wanted an interview. So the army produced Goering for a press conference, and Goering came out of the house in which, which he had been staying and sat under the trees in the garden and was thoroughly enjoying his press conference with the Americans, the, the give and take. And one of the questions was, do you, do you realize that your name is on the list of war criminals to be tried? And this, uh, this shook Goering. And uh, he replied, no, I didn't know that, and uh, it's, I, I can't imagine why. But from this point on, he was, he was not enjoying the press conference. There was nothing in his treatment at this point which, which gave him any idea that, that he was going to be uh, looked on as a war criminal. He was allowed to wear his uniform, his medals, and I think that he thought that everything was going fine. Goering's celebrity treatment ended abruptly when the army moved him to a prisoner interrogation center. It was there that he was stripped of his medals and he was uh, a ceremonial dagger that he wore was taken away from him and uh, his insignia was removed. And I think it was at this time he realized that all was not well. In August 1945, after three months in custody, the army moved Goering to a cell at the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg. The selection of Nuremberg was only fitting. During the 1930s, the city's destiny marched closely in step with that of Germany's Führer and the Nazi Party. But the practical, rather than the propaganda reasons, brought the accused to Nuremberg. The Palace of Justice was the only large courthouse that had survived the Allied bombing raids. By the end of September, 22 Nazi leaders, men who once controlled the fate of Europe, 
sat in Nuremberg's tiny cells, 